Thank you very much indeed for that. Absolutely fascinating. I found all three speakers brilliant. Firstly, brilliant because they stuck to time, which is uh, so unusual, I find, in these things. It's uh, really to turn personal congratulation from everyone here. The second thing is I mustn't therefore spoil it by rattling on. Um, I've taken away one or two messages from this, which is quite interesting. And I think part of the problem comes, the way, what Tom was saying, actually what everyone's saying, is we're looking at all these things the wrong way around in many, many, many government pro projects. Very sadly, I missed the first part, part of this, the, the thing this afternoon. But one of the big problems is if you were to go out to a large consultancy and say, we want to give you this huge project to reinvent, uh, to invent the wheel, or reinvent the wheel usually, because someone's done this on a smaller scale somewhere else, what's your prime objective as a fee-earning partner? You know, it is to spin it out and make it as big and as complicated as possible. So when you think about what you just heard here, it's exactly the opposite, which I think is the right way to go. I used to write software and design systems. I cannot understand what the problem is on these big projects. Most of these things are so simple. They're just simple database, database, database management. What's the problem? Except they throw so many people in there, presumably they're always liaising, interfacing, cooperating, and everything. Anyway, I'm going to leave that around, or I'll be on this all day. One or two things I took away from this. Um, one of the interesting, you know what I said at the beginning about, um, about uh, using visual information in a different way other than um, writing? Uh, Jerry Fishenden's map of the, all those connections, etc. Now, dyslexics have no problems with those things. Dyslexics are very, usually very good at multidimensional pattern matching, recognition, and fitting things in. Procedural things will have thought, oh my God, what a mess. Actually, you know, there are whole other ways of communicating in that, and that's, I think, is important. I think this whole thing of agile development is vitally important. And this whole thing, when you go to a government department and show them this through your public office, and you go and show them all the things, presumably they say immediately, well, we better go out to tender, and we know we'll have to get this entire thing redesigned and redeveloped by someone who'll cock it up. I mean, what, why can't we start using these things? And that's a quite really the question. I'm going to sit down at that point, because this is the question and answer center, se session, and so we'll have a few questions. Um, I think first up was Casper. Casper Bowden, Chief Privacy Advisor for Microsoft in Europe. So I too was struck um, by the contrast between the first half presentations and the second half presentations. Uh, but it, it struck me that although nobody sort of labelled these halves as such, we're talking about two very different types of system. In, in the first part of the session, I think we're talking about systems involving fantastic degrees of totally arbitrary complexity, such as the tax and benefit system, which are essentially created by the process of legislation. They are accreted over perhaps 40 years of parliaments, making addition and addition and fine tune and exemption to what the statute book says about how a particular aspect of life must be dealt with. And that is, as it were, the mindset of the system implementers. They have to do what the legislation says, no matter how astonishingly complicated and incomprehensible <laughs> that is for the citizen. The second half, I think we're talking about user-centric systems, where very much either from a set of relatively simple structured data sets or from, uh, as it were, the potentialities of new technology, you're trying to do totally something totally different on a, on a sort of greenfield site. And I, you know, I applaud everything that uh, Tom has done over the past few years, and I, I also very much appreciated his uh, uh, endorsement of the important, uh, importance of privacy. But these types of system are not really the same kind of animal at all. And I think the interesting question that we, we, we've got today is how they relate to each other, and, and should one supplant the other? Um, I, I, can give, uh, I, I would say they are not totally different. Remember, what they work for you is, is it's a version of Hansard, which is crazy and incomprehensible and arbitrarily handed down from previous generations. Um, the, the tax one is a lovely example. Yes, the tax system is really complicated, but it has, uh, as far as I can tell, the Inland Revenue has had no button on its homepage saying pay your tax for the last three or four years. Um, that is a usability emission that will have cost the taxpayer, ironically, enormous amounts in terms of the number of people who didn't use that website because they couldn't find that button. There is no excuse for systems that are incapable of grabbing the low-hanging fruit because they're so obsessed by process redesign. It's uh, like you could do so much to improve the process of paying tax in the UK without touching tax law at all. And that is that should actually happen first, and then we should move on. I fully take the point about the extreme complexity of things like, uh, I mean, there's probably no living human being who understands the welfare system or, 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 or the tax system. Well. But simplifying those things... It, you know, involves winners and losers and complex political judgments, uh, which, which are different from the technological and political. I think the area that interests me and that I've noticed 
is, is effectively the mashups area where the big complex systems can produce data and using a technique like the BBC did with, with Backstage, if you make that data available, certain good things will, 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 will grow up, which is what Tom's, Tom's demonstrated. But I think yeah, your, your distinction is valid. Uh, I think there's also some interesting parallels between the way law is currently phrased and what computer science could teach, the phrasing of law. There were um, the various systems out there that are rules-based into which people have fed legislation and then automatically being able to point out that it's got full of inconsistencies, contradictions and stuff. And you have to ask why isn't the law as it's being passed through Parliament actually subjected to a very formal use of logic to validate that it actually delivers against the objectives for which that law was actually being drafted, <coughs> rather than as it seems as a computer scientist time after time, it comes out and constantly gets refined and arbitrated by lawyers in the legal profession who make a living out of the interpretation of the ambiguities left in that law in the first place. I, I'm going to very quickly add to that, so a lot of Jerry's comments, and then we we'll, we'll, We've got about four or five questions. We're about to be very quick on each one if we want to move on. Um, I think I can help quickly on this, which is the problem is if you take tax law, tax law is not primarily there to be logical. It's there to try and be used for social purposes, social engineering purposes, according to the political philosophy of the party in power at the time. And as a result, you get this logicality that is trying to manipulate people and their behaviour instead of getting on with the business of financing government logically. And if it was actually made citizen-centric to help citizens, we'd look at a very different system. Unfortunately, that is philosophically unacceptable to our political leaders, by and large, which is a great shame. Um, now, I had a couple of questions there who were quick up with their hands. Yes. I'm Terry Doughty from Action on Rights for Children. Um, I'm sorry, Jerry. I don't know if you knew you were standing on a landmine when you talked about um, the descent into offending um, it's actually a perfect example of why technology shouldn't drive public policy. Um, what we've come to know from research is that the best way of dealing with youth offending is to leave it well alone. And the, the less you criminalise young people, the more you keep them right away from agencies. The evidence now is unequivocal from research. They will spontaneously, the majority, stop offending by the time they reach 17, 18. So. Um, the problem with information sharing and, and keeping all this information joined up is that it doesn't know when to turn a blind eye, uh, and I think that's a real problem for children and young people. We also have huge problems around consent when we're talking about sharing young people's information. Who consents? Parents? Children? Both? Uh, do parents consent and then a child withdraw it later on if they change their mind, but then the information's already out there? There are such huge issues in children's policy and also in youth justice policy. And I think we have to be careful also that we are not okay. making normative um, things like uh, not looking at what the education system's actually doing, what the special needs system's actually doing, and the over-arresting of children that's going on, and the over-criminalisation. So I'd be interested to know what you think, all of you, about this capacity to make, to create normative systems where, where actually there are structural problems. I, I, I guess I failed on two counts, if, if you're disagreeing with me, because one was the diagram was of the system as it is now, with an adolescent just falling between the cracks of all the different agencies. And the whole point being, it wasn't being designed around their needs. And earlier, the sticking plaster of the data sharing was the fact that that is an inappropriate way to fix the problem, other than short term. It's putting lipstick on the pig. Why not address the problem? People seem to think you can fix data sharing by throwing technology at it, rather than trying to work out how you remodel the services based on the needs of the individual in the system. So. I apologise, I've failed on both counts to get those points across, then <laughs> I've failed. So. Do you, do you There's none to add to that, no. no. Any comment to um, uh, the, the trouble is I don't really want to comment on either because it's um, hugely complex and I'd rattle on for far too long because I've got huge problems with the whole thing. The only thing I would comment to is when, I can't remember which we were speaking at the time, and I suddenly made a note to myself thinking, you know, we're spending huge amounts of money on carers to manage people's lives because all the systems are hierarchical systems. They're about controlling people's lives to improve them. Actually, having sat on juries a couple of times, I think a lot of people have got a lot of common sense and could manage their own lives very well if they had the information on how to manage them properly. And I think we're looking at a lot of the, this whole thing the wrong way around because we're creating, because people 
who are like that want to control other people and want to help other people. Helping can be a form of control. There are huge problems in there, and I, I would probably put it completely wrong and get shot down for saying it in public. Jim. Yeah. A very quick point, Marlin, and that is, unlike the point Tom was making, I actually did agree with most of what was said in the second half, and I just want to link the two. And we'll use tax as an example. About seven years ago, I went to Treasury with a proposal they look at the Finnish tax system because they had looked at the people dimension of this. And what the Finns did in rebuilding their system was to say, well, hang on a minute, why don't we treat our citizens as being honest as opposed to crooks? Therefore, since we hold most of the information, we will populate the tax form and send it electronically to the citizen. The citizen's got three weeks to correct it if it's wrong. This went down a bundle with the Finns, who didn't actually much appreciate being presented with 30 pages to fill in information the government already had. And it married, I think, the two points. First of all, you can take the old legacy system if you want to run tax that way, but you can radically change the way they're used in a way which actually wins a hell of a lot of friends. I'm still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. any, any response on that? I suspect Point it's well. too logical for government. Yeah. Point well made. Maybe. Point well made, absolutely. Dal Wakor of London Metropolitan University and the Foundation for Information Policy Research. Just to pick up on something that both ter that Terry said and something that Casper said. There is, of course, the, the complexity of the system. That's one aspect in which things are different. There's also, I, I get slightly allergic to the government constantly saying I'm a consumer or a client. In many ways, we are not consumers or clients. A person in a police cell is not a client of the police. Um, <laughs> and it, it's actually quite useful to mention that. And that does add to the complexity of government systems in that somebody has to decide uh, over and against the the, the wishes of the individual very often, and that is when it gets difficult. So data, share, data sharing, uh, making it government-centric, and the marvelous plans that, that various people have to say, I can decide on what happens, is great, until the government decides that it knows better. And then, um, as Terry points out, and I, I was involved in the report that we wrote on children's databases, that um, very often the decisions that are made over and against the wishes of the, the client, the customer, are not necessarily in their interest. And how do you balance that? As a lawyer, I have to say, I wish you could make rules that computers could apply in law, but I, th I think you're stuck with lawyers for a long time to come, I'm afraid. Um, the only thing I, I would add very quickly to it is this whole problem is, is you cannot control a complex society of people with links in it by using rules. Rules only work in simple systems. Mm -hmm. And so we, in, in our old common law system, we had a system where we set boundaries policed by the police, with juries keeping an eye on them in case they're out, of lunch, out to lunch. Um, on the continent, they were used to papal bulls and lots of un unlivable with rules coming out. So they evolved a system where they ignored the rules and, and went, got on with life accordingly. And I'm afraid to say this is the trouble. There are people who believe that they can manage people's drives for their own good. And there are some people who need their lives managing for their own good. But the trouble is we shouldn't apply it to everyone. I don't I think it's a continental UK division, but we'll get into that on another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Ross, I think we'll take you then, Bruce. I suppose I'd just like to briefly uh, challenge William's assumption, in fact, the assumption of many people in government that a single point of contact is a good thing. Um, I actually appreciate the fact that I've got a choice locally of four different GPs to go to, and the fact that one has a relationship with one's GP that's qualitatively different from the relationship with one's uh, local copper. Now, we, we had 250 years ago a relationship, a, a single point of contact relationship with government in the form of the local landowner, landowner uh, who was your landlord and your employer and also the magistrate. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that sometimes it worked absolutely swimmingly, the Gretz, you know, if uh, you were performing that role in Putten, Merlin, mm -hmm. um, but it's an unfortunate historical fact that not all members of the aristocracy were as enlightened, and so we do things differently nowadays. Therefore, the assumption that you need a single point of, con of contact, I think, is highly dubious. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you raised that, because it's not an impression I'm meant to give. Um, in, in working through the public office, when, when, when the teams redesigned public services around the needs of users, they came up with three models. One was a single point of, of, of contact, and I think there's a strong case for NHS Direct. I think Google is great as a single point of contact, and you know, one directory inquiries number is fine. But there's a separate model, which is multiple points of contact. No wrong door. Wherever you go is the right place, and, uh, which is connectable and also where there's choice and competition. And there's a third model, 
which is very heavily resource-intensive mediated access. When you talk about your, to your GP about your case to get exactly, or an independent financial advisor, or, or um, a, a situation where you're handheld through something difficult and complicated. And there's no one right solution. If you look at the range of um, public service challenges we've got nationally, you need all three. And there are some situations where the single point is incredibly simple and cost effective, and self service makes it really cheap. There's some situations where the competition is essential and, and, and important to, to, to differentiate and not have all your eggs in the same basket. And there are some difficult and labour intensive situations. Hi, I've got one here. Bruce, yeah. um, so if, as um, uh, Jerry suggested, we, we don't build big systems, we need some way of sticking sy these little systems together. I would have thought that open standards would play a fairly large role in that, and I'd be interested in hearing what the panel had to say about that and how important open standards were. I agree. I mean, if you look at what's happened on the internet, uh, a, lo a lot of it's been driven through um, open specifications and protocols that people picked up and reused. So the fact you can pick up all these different models on the internet plug them together and get them working in ways that actually make sense to the individual. So I think getting that level of interoperability, and again we would see a huge payback on some of the government systems if the traditional procurement model has very much been built, you know, specified to purpose, by to purpose, and it, it's, it's sort of back to front silo centric. But actually if they were designed to take advantage of the way the internet has worked, where they're much more granular and componentized, not only do you open up the market in the UK to much smaller IT companies, and typically SMEs won't be the gun procurements because they're far too massive and risky and worrisome, but also you would enable more than the sum of the parts, if you like, because as we've seen with the internet, people come along and do fantastically crazy and inventive things that were never imagined that are actually immensely valuable to all of us. So, so is this um, Herald Microsoft's um, move following the, what they've done with um, the info card and card space to giving more to the open source community? I think it's a distinction between open source and open specifications, which we don't really get. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist well, the team. Well, one's that other <laughs> The other's different commercial software. I know, don't worry. That's a, that's a pulling leg. I think you're absolutely right to raise the question of, of what uh, Microsoft's done with, with, with card space, because that's a shift from a wholly centralised architecture proposed around 2000 mm -hmm. to one which is more user-centric, perhaps a monopoly, perhaps it'll be open standard. We won't go into the whole philosophical open document format thing, but I think the big question for transformational government is, should the data about your health or your financial dealings with the government, should that all reside at the centre and be centralised, or actually should it be user-centric and res reside with the user in, in line with the sort of card space model you suggest? Anyway, right. Um, I think I'll just take one, one more question from there, if that, unless you're very pressing, because I've been asked to knock it on the head about now, so why don't okay. you? Okay. Um, my, my question is really about the uh, mismatch which I see between agile development and the gateway process. And if anybody has found a way around it, I worked inside the Department of Work and Pensions trying to get agility and gateway to fit together, and they absolutely <laughs> did not. The concept of iterative incremental procurement is just not built in. And we need to have that for, to take advantage of a lot of the things that were said. And that would bring together what was said about big systems in the first part and the ability to put, lock in little patches and bits and bobs around it that, that make everything user friendly. And, and, and there's just, there is a drive from the OGC strictly to go down the sort of heavy duty, full requirements, full design, full spec, etc. Don't want to take it. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I do share your concern about the gateway process. I can see why they brought it in. I think there's a danger of it being kind of um, centralising and sort of, uh, sort of, uh, we're cleverer than everyone else, so we'll set down rules which will mean there's never ever fa a failure ever again. I much prefer the design-derived concept of co-creation, which they sometimes call... If you involve the customers and users in what's actually needed and in the decisions about what you do and in monitoring and feedback as you go along, then I think you're much more likely to get some, you know, something which works to the satisfaction of the customer than an over-prescriptive procurement process in which customers aren't involved. But you haven't found a, re a resolution to this. <laughs> no, no. I would just um, advocate learning from the design community about co-creation, co-design, monitoring and feedback, and what you might call co-governance. Do you want to say anything? I might, I yeah. might, I want to make one quick comment, which one of the problems is to do with how people think as well. 
Um, a good civil servant, I often say, is someone who will be risk averse and good at process because they'll make sure you get your next passport, your driving license or whatever. Things will happen. And what they don't want to take is risk with that procedure. Um, entrepreneurs and people can think agilely on their feet, see where the next thing's coming from left field, but I wouldn't leave them in charge of running a process because they'll be reinventing the wheel so fast it won't happen. Those two mindsets don't fit closely together. And you should find the, the risk averse in government, which is why we don't want everyone in government to be risk averse, which the whole theory is that the other lot should be in parliament, thinking strategically. Anyway, so without getting to political speech, you've got problems with the way, about the way, the way people think, and I don't think we're going to change that overnight. And how we get the two to work together is quite a challenge. Um, okay. yeah. I, I'd actually like to respond to that, and, and I didn't have a chance to respond to the previous mm. one, yeah, sorry. so sorry, just two yeah. quickly together. Um, one way you can get around gateway projects is, is simply stop building big projects because if uh, gateways are there to stop you accidentally wasting 100 million quid, if you go this project innately doesn't cost 100 million quid, this is basically a 50,000 pound project with 900 million pounds of consulting on top, then, um, <laughs> then, 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 you, then you don't need to. So, so focusing on cheaper, smaller, cheaper projects not only will make for each of those individual components being smaller and ro ro more robust, but you can go under the under some of those radars. That said, I've heard the gateway process is much better than not having it when you aren't building hundred million pound projects. So, um, on on stand on standards, I think what's really important about standards that other than to use them is don't set standards across whole departments in government with no evidence of demand. Get good at asking your users what standards they want and get good at implementing them really, really quickly when they do want them. That is what the Office of Public Sector Information is going to, going to do where they're going to build a site that's a little bit like a petition site where you can go along and say there's some bit of information from government. It's in the wrong format. It's under the wrong license. It's published at the wrong time. Please do it differently. And other people will be able to come and say, yeah, I also need that. And if I could, then I could set up this business. I could do this, that. It's kind of naming and shaming uh, unresponsive <coughs> organizations into to, to publishing their information better. This is one such unresponsive organization. Um, if you could have a tiny change in the way the parliament produced its bills, the comprehensibility of these incredibly vital documents would go through the roof. The number of people reading them would go through the roof. The quality of our law could go up a little bit. <laughs> um, and and, 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 and it's, like, it's a tiny project held up in nightmarish uh, parliamentary IT committee land where there's 252 people trying to do a project that needs two. So. Thank you. Okay. I think we're knocked on the head there because we're now running five minutes later and I was told what I, that, that which we could overrun to. Anyway, um, just to highlight what you're just saying, if you take a look at the enunciator screens up there, they're on the intranet. You can't get them on the internet. There's nothing secret about them. I've been trying to get them moved onto the internet for, I think I've been asking for about a year now or more. Anyway, no chance. It's some in some sort of great policy decision project group. So, and I'm afraid that's how the system works. And um, it works everywhere that way, and it's a nightmare. But anyway, thank you very much for those presentations. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think it's been a brilliant session. You've now got a chance to network and pick everyone's, bend everyone's ears and everything like that. So I don't think I'm going to stand in your way any longer. Oh, thank you also very much indeed to Post and to the OII for putting this on. And um, actually, do you, David, also want to say the last few words? Yeah, yes, uh, well, thanks. First of all, thank you, Merlin. Yes. Now, listen, you think getting that on the uh, internet is a problem. You should try booking this room. <laughs> 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 oh, I, I, I won't go into the details. Um, before I forget, you may remember in the first session, a gentleman, he's not here, um, asked a question of the previous panel, and none of us, well, I had a stab at North Korea. Uh, I wasn't wrong, so far wrong. It's actually the government of Victoria, the state in Australia, if anybody wanted to know the answer on that question. Anyway, yes, it was also interesting that Jim raised... Um, Finland and the uh, tax system there. Uh, our sister organisation at the Finnish Parliament rejoices under the wonderful name of the Committee for the Future. Now, again, if you've created such a thing here, Philip will know that you'd be laughed out of the place in five minutes. You know, Committee for the Future, Future. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and Derek would agree uh, as well. But uh, they, what they've also done, interestingly, is they very much pioneered the use of IT within parliaments, not so much in government, because it's a parliamentary institution, but they've done a, a lot of work, uh, and there are a lot of um, lessons that we can learn from uh, what they've done. It's true, it's a small country, it's a cohesive country, and so on and so forth, but uh, we're trying to learn, as I say, many of the lessons from them and see if we can apply them here at Westminster.
Their ID well, that's uh, a big pardon. Their ID card project failed. Did it? Ah, oh, well, there you are. <laughs> Another lesson. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right. Well, uh, that, 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 that's enough from from me, except to say it's not all over yet, because not only is there a drinks reception next door, you can enjoy some of the House of Commons wine, but rather unusually, uh, I understand that we're actually going to have a final speaker during the reception, who is Simon Davies from the uh, LSE. So do join us next door. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope you found it valuable. Uh, and if there are any comments you've got on how we've organised this, in the ways we could have done it better, do get in contact. Do um, look at our website. I apologise that the URL... See, another way in which Parliament works, that's a pretty simple URL there. They've now changed that to something that's about five times as long. That's progress for you. <laughs> and we just can't get them to do a link from the simple one to the new one. But there you go. Anyway. Enough of whinging from me. You're welcome next door. Thank you very much.